my good friend and colleague, Megan Wind, um, offered to give this presentation. And I'm so grateful to her for doing that. And I'm honestly very eager to learn about Rhythm in Motion, the history of tap, American tap dance. Um, Megan is very well qualified to be giving this presentation today. She is a dancer, a choreographer, and a performer. Many of you are aware of who she is because she did the choreography for the Little Shop of Horrors program, which she signed up to do like days after moving to Ely. So <laughs> she has been living in Ely for less than six months and has already made herself a staple in the community and, and supporter of the community. And we're so grateful to her for that. Um, she grew up dancing competitively and she went to the St. Paul Conservatory for Performing Arts. She studied and performed um, nationally and internationally with multiple professional dance companies. And she is here to teach us a about the history of American tap dance. Thank you so much, Megan, for being here. Welcome. So I find most of my like confidence and inspiration when I'm dancing. So I'm gonna kick off this presentation that way so I can kind of get into the flow of that um, since public speaking is not my top um, skill. So uh, I'm just gonna do a little bit at the front. If you wanna stand, if you can't see in the back, it's gonna be kind of short and sweet. Um, but yeah, so we'll start then. Really tried uh, dancing on that as well. It's just a lot slipperier than I thought. Um, we'll get started. Okay, so what defines tap dance? Let's start there. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I gotta catch my breath. Um, so tap dance is both considered an art form of dance, but also an art form of music. Um, it's heavily based in jazz music, which we'll discuss more at length in a little bit. Um, it is the combination of both movement and rhythm. Um, so there's a big musical component and also a big movement component. Um, and you can also think of the tap shoe kind of as like a percussive instrument. Do we have any drummers in the room? Do you, can you give me a little something on the table? A little... So that'd be like, that'd be like a good example of Kind of like the bass note of a drum, you know. My heels are more like a bass, where um, like the tip is more like a hi hat. So you can kind of think about different parts of the shoe, create different sounds, um, kind of the equivalent to the way a drummer would. Um, there's two major variations of tap dance. Um, so actually, okay, let me ask one question: How many of you have seen tap dance live before in person? Okay, a good few of you. Um, raise your hand if you might have seen it like on Broadway and it's choreographed and it's this big production. More of you. How many of you have seen it with maybe there's a soloist um, with like a jazz band and they're doing mostly improvisation? Go ahead, a handful of you. So there's kind of like those two different camps and there's like a little bit of a gradient in the middle and I'll kind of explain that more in a minute. But um, that's just like two ways that you can think of how tap dance exists in the world. Um, so here's some of the characteristics of tap dance. Um, one is syncopation or just the type of rhythm that you're doing. Um, it's like I said, big, big or heavily based in jazz music. Um, and it kind of fits, you could either be like the drummer in a song. So you're just kind of like a holding a beat. And you kind of repeat that over and over again, or you could be the soloist and you're kind of just adding on to the top of it. Um, improvisation is a big piece of it. So like everything I just did at the beginning was improvisation. Um, I can also do choreography, but that's like a big piece of it, um, especially if you're doing or like performing as a soloist and whatnot. Um, and then yeah, movement's also a big part. So uh, I guess if you've seen the big more Broadway spectacular kind of um, dancing, that usually has more choreographed arms. There's like a little bit more flair and finesse on it. Um, but if you see the more improvised, like I was <laughs> looking down at the floor right there and kind of just doing whatever with my arms, but I was focusing more on the musical aspect. So those are kind of the three 
major characteristics. Um, just quickly on the anatomy of tap shoes, um, most of them have metal taps. Originally, they had no taps at all, and we'll kind of get more into that history in a second. Um, a lot of them had wooden soles. Uh, mine currently have leather soles um, and leather exterior with kind of like a wood shank separating from the metal taps. Um, they can, like I said, be compared to a drum set. We kind of already talked about that. Uh, there's two major uh, tap shoe makers currently in production. One of them is, or the company is Block, and the other one's Capizio. Um, I have Block shoes on right now. Um, they can range anywhere from like 100 to $450, depending on your ability. So if you want to be a beginner, there's ways to do it cheaper than $100, but that's kind of like the base. And then once you get to professional level, you have multiple pairs of $400 shoes because that's just the way it is. So, um, you got to take care of them well. Um, okay, so let's go back to this kind of spectrum of dance. So um, an example of the kind of more performative Broadway style choreographed would be like the Rockettes would be a good example if you've ever seen them before. Um, very precise, uh, the, all the arms are there. Um, sometimes the steps can be even more simple or more complicated. Um, and then you have the percussive side, which is more jazz based or musical. You're instead of thinking about the steps, you're thinking about the what the rhythm is. Like if I'm improvising, I'll be like, I want to hit a da 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 da. So it's just kind of thinking about the rhythm ahead of time, and then your feet just somehow spit it up, <laughs> or it feels that way to me. Um, and typically that's done more as a soloist, but you can do that work in a group setting, which I'll show a clip of towards the end. Zoom crowd, we're going to send you a link because the video through the Zoom is going to be uh, difficult. So moving on. Um, we're going to get a little bit into the history of tap dance. Um, tap dance is an original American art form. What does that mean? Um, so it's kind of steeped in the same history that America is based off of. Um, it has also unfortunately formed out of racism and oppressed peoples, which we'll get more into in a second as well. Um, but out of that came this beautiful art form. So it is originally from America. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Okay. Next. Okay, so it kind of all starts um, during the Atlantic slave trade. In the 1500s, enslaved Africans were shipped to the West Indies. Um, during this time, drums were taken away from them. They weren't allowed to do their traditional dances or sing their traditional songs and things like that. Um, and so within the Caribbean, um, they ended up, well, let me not get ahead here. So anyways, uh, slave laws in the 1740s prohibited them from beating any drums because they didn't want an uprising. So they kind of had to find creative ways around that. So that's where a lot of percussive body music like um, bone clapping and jaw boning and hand clapping and other um, hand bone style of percussive dance. So that's like a lot of like stuff like that. So they're just kind of learning how to play music on their bodies because that's the only tool that they have. Um, and they also use that to communicate. So um, like if a plantation owner or slave owner was coming down the road and someone knew they might have been getting in trouble, someone could give them a little like clap, clap, snap, snap, better get going kind of vibe. And that was another way for them to communicate things that they needed to without having to like yell to the next person. Um, and a lot of these, I guess, rhythms and songs and things of that nature were passed down orally and would often change day to day and person to person. So I could be singing one song on the side of the field and then like people keep singing it and then on the other side of the field it could end up being different lyrics or a different rhythm or a different tone so it was never recorded it was never kind of kept it kept like changing and evolving day to day and person to person okay now comes in um the european influence so when uh the irish okay so let's go back so in the 1650s during the 13 year war between england and spain um, about 40,000 Irish soldiers were essentially just shipped off, deported, um, sold into indentured servitude in the Caribbean. Um, so they're working out a lot on these tobacco farms down there. And then kind of moving out the indentured service and bringing in more slaves, there's a mixing of the two cultures. Um, and that is kind of how some of the, I guess, movement came more into these rhythms. Um, so Irish dancers typically dance like stiff armed, their body's pretty like tight and kind of more like this. Um, whereas a lot of West African style of dances are more like looser torsos. It's low, you're kind of like more grounded a little bit, you have a lot more use of the arms. Um, so the blending of those two cultures uh, ended up coming to be what's called jigging. 
Um, and that essentially became a term for this new American percussive hybrid that was recognized as a black style of dancing then. Um, so tap dance is inherently a black art form because it kind of came from this history. And yeah, so um, yeah, tap dance is a black art form and that's kind of the way we recognize it today. So um, with influences from multiple European um, cultures, but at the end of the day, it came from um, slaves in South of the US. Okay, so minstrel shows. Um, so in the beginning of the 19th century, there was a new form of theater that was also inherently racist and quite awful because um, <laughs> mostly white actors would wear blackface and essentially like mimic the movements and the dialects and some of the dancing of African Americans. Um, and yeah, they essentially liked what they saw with the jigging and just kind of wanted to bring it to a stage um, to perform for white audiences. Um, so yeah, by 1840, um, this became one of the most popular uh, forms of entertainment in America. Um, so they're traveling around, it kind of bled into the um, vaudeville a little bit. And then um, there was a migration towards New York where a lot of those shows were touring and whatnot, um, including in the Five Points District. So the Five Points District is where emancipated slaves had fled north um, after the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, There's also former um, Irish immigrant or Irish indentured servants there who um, were immigrants. So they were in this neighborhood. Uh, there was kind of a lot of crime and there was unsanitary and there was kind of heightened tensions because they all kind of just fled this awful experience. And um, yeah, so the, both their cultures didn't necessarily get along at first, but there was kind of a sharing of customs and ideas between culture and that kind of like, brought along the jigging as well as um, some other uh, forms of dance, which I'll get to in a moment. Um, but yeah, so in the Five Points District of New York, there's also a lot of brothels and saloons. So there's places for people to be performing and trying to make money, including young William Henry Lane. Um, he was born in Rhode Island and then moved to New York to perform and try to make some money because he was born a free person. Um, so he picked up jigging, um, he became known for his like, grace and his technique and his innovative way of blending some more of these rhythms and getting more syncopation and things like that. Um, and he started touring with these minstrel shows that we just talked about and um, he would do these dance challenges where like they would kind of do a little footwork and do a little footwork and then somebody would end up being a winner. Um, and he won every time. <laughs> so they started calling him Master Juba and Juba comes from that um, the African style of dance that's percussive, like the body um, body percussion. So, but yeah, he was one of the most influential figures in the creation of American tap dance. He's the one who started putting the footwork and making it a little bit more detailed um, and making it more musical. Let's see. Okay. Um, so from this era of jigging and uh, the minstrel shows, there's other forms that started coming in. So buck dancing, which is kind of similar to like European clogging. Um, there's also soft shoe dancing. So typically done without like uh, metal taps or wood taps. And it's kind of a lot smoother. Like this doesn't sound smooth with my taps on, but it's a lot more like graceful and elegant. Um, and then there's also buck and wing dancing, which is kind of fast and flashy. Like legs are flying up in the air. People are doing a lot more kicks and stuff like that. Um, and then kind of in the evolution too is when they finally added metal taps on in the 20s, which kind of just got the wheel or the, the ball moving a little bit more. Um, so yeah, they kept evolving. And according to the producer, Leonard Reed, who's also a tap dancer throughout the 1920s, there wasn't a show that didn't feature tap dancing during this time. If you couldn't dance, you couldn't get a job. So it's kind of just everyone who was performing had some kind of rhythmic element to their performance at that time. All right. Um, so we're just going to fly south a little bit here to New Orleans um, and talk about jazz music for a sec. So jazz music, similar to tap dance, kind of was born in an era where people there's emancipated um, African Americans. There was also Europeans living in the area, and it was kind of in this pressure cooker of culture, if you will. Um, so jazz music came from roots and blues and ragtime, kind of traditional African um, 
rhythms. Uh, a lot of the instruments that they're using at the time were like washboards, wash tubs, jugs, boxes, sticks, bones, whatever they could find to get their hands on and just start playing in the street. Um, I think it's called Congo Square is where like a lot of this started happening. Um, and that kind of got more influence with jazz and whatnot. And yeah, jazz became very popular in the 1920s and ended up becoming popular in New York. And that's kind of where rap and jazz kind of met for the first time and just exploded. So we'll get into that. So a lot of where the performers um, were working with jazz musicians and learning to tap was in the nightclubs of New York and even in LA and Chicago and things like that. But a lot of it was in New York. Um, and one of the very popular clubs was called the Cotton Club, um, which was in uh, operation from 1923 to 1940. Um, and they're Basically, all the jazz musicians you can think of and tap dancers had performed there at one point. Um, but the problem was that you could not be a patron of the Cotton Club if you were Black. You could only be white, but all of their performers were Black. Um, so this includes Duke Ellington, Armstrong, Count Basie, um, Cab Cal, Holiday, uh, Catherine Dunham as a performer. We'll get more into the Nicholas Brothers, Leonard Reed. Et cetera, et cetera. So this is one of the major clubs that kind of attracted that audience. And you can even kind of see on that sign right there, like Bill Robinson had his name in the marquee. Um, but yeah, I'll tell you a little more about him in a second. Okay, and then the other, I'm gonna air quote club. Um, so it's kind of more of like an old pool hall that all the old tap dancers would hang out at. And it was called the Hoopers Club and it was right by Lafayette Theater. Um, but it was essentially a 12 by 12 room. There was probably like 10 to 15 male tap dancers there at a time. And they would essentially share, share steps, steal steps, challenge each other. It was kind of just like a way for them to like workshop what they're working on, um, get inspiration from other people. And I don't know if you've ever seen a tap jam before, um, but it's essentially you have like a bunch of people in a circle. One person does their little four bars and then passes it on to the next person, four bars. And you kind of just keep sharing and growing and um it's that's still done today i've been in a lot of tap jams and that's super fun so if you ever get a chance to watch one it's it's amazing what people can do through improvisation and just the way they can hear music and it's an incredible experience um and so one thing they had written on the wall in the club was thou shall not copy each other's steps exactly <laughs> so you can steal like a little bit <laughs> um but yeah so some of the rookie and veteran tap dancers that were there included Bill Robinson, John Bubbles, Honey Cole, Baby Lawrence, and a bunch of other folks. But um, yeah, and the term hoofer, I should say, is usually kind of saved for like the legacy tap dancers, like the like old school legendary people that you can think of. So I would not identify as a hoofer because that is I just haven't reached that level of caliber, and it's kind of just more for the the older crowd. So the hoofers were like the real the real big deal back in the day. And still are today. Some of them are still alive. Um, okay, so Bill Bojangles Robinson. Some of you may know him as dancing with uh, the lovely uh, Shirley Temple. Um, he probably had one of the biggest influences on American tap dance, but also a big influence on, um, uh, I guess, like entertainment and movies and just like uh, which Black folks were allowed to participate in these things because they kind of weren't allowed to be on screen and things at the time. Um, so he was the most highly paid African American entertainer in the United States in the first half of the 20th century. So he was a big deal. Um, he also advocated for a lot of other people to get um, equal rights, especially in the entertainment industry. Um, he broke a lot of racial barriers. He was one of the first minstrel and vaudeville performers to appear as black without the use of blackface makeup. Yes, they had black people use blackface makeup for minstrel shows, which is absurd. Um, and he was also one of the first black performers to perform solo, um, overcoming vaudeville's two colored rule. So if a black person was on stage, they also had to have a white person on stage with them to dance with them. Um, and that was just, yeah, the role of vaudeville at the time. So he was the first one to kind of break through that, which is awesome. Um, and him and Shirley Temple were the first interracial dance partners in Hollywood history. So, yeah. Oh, he's also known for the stair dance, which I will show you in a second. I've learned how to do a stair dance, not his. It was very difficult and it's really cool. So I'll show you that next. 
yeah so you essentially each step kind of has a different tone based off like how far off you're off the floor so it's like I don't want to compare it to playing a piano but it kind of has that same tonality that each step sounds different um and there's one step he could do it's not in this clip so I just could only get a gift for this but he stands on the top step and sort of hops backward and his front tap just hits all the steps and then he just rides out of it and like does his little rhythm and it's I've tried it. it's really hard <laughs> it's really cool though um yeah and then this uh, again stair dance with Shirley Temple um I think I already talked about that but yeah so he was in a bunch of films with her and um they kind of wanted him to choreograph for her um but she was seven years old and couldn't quite get the steps so he took whatever that she could do and then kind of matched him her level um so that they were able to perform well together and do cool stuff like this so all right moving along um so there's this style called the class act which i think is kind of like the most popular or like the most recognizable form of tap dance um it definitely became more popular during the jazz age and the swing era um and it was kind of just like exhibited uh precision and people were dressed up elegantly in their suits and there's kind of like a coolness and like a flawlessness to everything um and it was kind of just like the honorable form of tap dance kind of like this is fancy this is like trying to like uh, uh i can't find the word i'm looking for but anyways um this usually was done by a duet or a soloist so some of the popular ones were coles and atkins or honey coles and charlie atkins um and i'll talk about charlie atkins again in a little bit um this also included john bubble who's considered one of the fathers of rhythm tap dancing there's a lot of these kind of names thrown about to who's the father who's kind of led the charge but uh, everyone had a great influence obviously um but john bubbles particularly uh changed the whole trend of jazz tap because he started time steps um kind of with more heel beats like a lot of tap dancing before this time everything's kind of on your toes and like your heels never drop down you don't use them as much and he was kind of the first person to like okay let's set it back a little bit so i'll do like a mini example but so like and then going to the heels And that little last bit is called shave and a haircut and it's usually how you end all tap dances so i'll talk about the shim sham later but then da, 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 is like how you end a lot of traditional tap dances but anyways um let's see uh john bubbles also performed with someone named ford buck washington and they also became the first black artist to perform at radio city music hall in 1936 oh and the first black artist on television anywhere in the world so crazy um Fred Astaire once called John Bubbles the finest tap dancer of his generation and he never coined that for anybody else so if you get a chance to look up clips of John Bubbles do so all right another class act so very widely recognized the Douglas Brothers they were known for doing super flashy um like jump in the air land of the splits the other guy jumps over his head lens splits, but just kind of this clip and I couldn't find a gif of this um, but there's like we'll watch a video at the end and you can kind of see a little bit more of that um but the brother fair taught himself how to dance by just watching other performers on stage and then kind of started figuring things out and just like kind of playing around at the park near his house and like see if you can do a backflip see if you can drop into the splits and then ended up teaching up his younger siblings um and then yeah they ended up being on a jazz circuit for a long time um here's a little gif of them you can see they're very suave their arms are very smooth um very in sync but yeah very talented and very acrobatic all right now let's get back to charlie atkins um so charlie atkins had a very long career um he started with him and honey poles they did a lot of vaudeville dancing debuting at the apollo theater in harlem new york um they toured extensively nationally and internationally performing in major showcases with big jazz bands and swing bands including louis armstrong count basie cab calloway um, they also performed on broadway um, for a long time and then Char charlie got approached in the 1950s to kind of teach some basic dance steps to vocal groups so they could kind of have like a little step touch action and he ended up being the main choreographer for motown so a lot of the classic stuff you see from like the supremes and the temptations that like kind of just like little groovy steps and stuff it's hard to do with my <laughs> um 
yeah, he kind of became, he's the one who kind of started that trend, um, which has had a huge influence on music today because those are essentially the first backup dancers, which is awesome because that's what we see in a lot of our mainstream music today. Um, so we can thank Charlie Atkins for that. Um, just a few other films that you may or may not know. These are kind of like the top tap films of the 30s to 50s, which was kind of in its peak moment, I would say. Um, so Second Street, Born to Dance, um, Swing Time, Stormy Weather, Singing in the Rain, Kiss Me Kate, and there's a bunch of others, but these are kind of just the ones that I feel like have iconic dance scenes in them that I enjoy. So, <laughs> and we'll watch like a little bit of a clip maybe at the end if we have time, but um, just thought I'd throw those out there. But yeah, film was just like a huge part of tap dance in that era. That's kind of what made it popular in that time. Um, and there was a lot of women also who finally in this era came to be um, more well-known. So Shirley Temple is on that list. Um, Jenny Lagan was also a dancer and actress, and she was the first African-American to establish a solo career in tap dance. Uh, we have Ginger Rogers. Uh, she was during the golden age of Hollywood. She won an Academy Award for Best Actress, um, performed in the 1930s with Fred Astaire in a lot of musical school films. Um, we have Eleanor Powell, who was kind of known for her like super fast tap sounds. Like I think she had point at that time and it's probably been beat by now but um she could get like 12 sounds a second or something outrageous but she's just known for just really fast um really fast beat and then we also have uh ann miller and cora reeds same thing part of the mgm kind of golden age uh we're typically featured as either dancing with a partner tap dancing or a soloist in a lot of these films as well all right um and then unfortunately the decline of tap dance in the 1950s. <laughs> um, and a lot of this was just because there was less demand. Vaudeville is kind of on its way out. Um, variety acts, minstrel shows, things like that. Um, film was picking up, but they kind of wanted to tell more or less musical stories. Um, so there was less of a value to have tap dance on. <laughs> um, and while some people say it died, a lot of these old school tap dancers said it didn't die. It just, uh, what do they use the word? Let's see didn't die, it was just neglected. So, um, and a lot of these old tap dancers like uh, John Bubbles and uh, Bill Robinson and Sandman Sims, they just like couldn't find work. So they ended up like working in hospitality and being servers or garbage men and things like that. So all this talent kind of just went to the wayside, which was unfortunate. Um, and then we had a lovely resurgence in the seventies. Kind of in the same age of like uh, like the 60s political movements and things like that, there was just kind of this um, inspiration for equality and things of that nature. So there's a lot of um, white college educated modern dance women in the 70s who were like, hey, these historical dances are really cool. Like, where are these guys? Oh, they're literally my elevator operator. Like, let's pull them out and try to learn from them and get some of this knowledge so we don't lose it. Um, so they kind of came out and neglected their modern and ballet upbringing and just like really threw themselves into tap. So some of these people who I've had the pleasure of taking class with and they're phenomenal, um, like Brenda Buffalino, who's, let's see if I can point out, she's down here. Um, she's still alive. I took class from her like a year ago. She's got so much like, like a wealth of knowledge and she just like got to spend time with a lot of these um older hoofers and like get knowledge from them and then just be able to pass it down to us which is really special and same thing with diane walker who's on this side um she held me when i was a baby because my mom's also a tap dancer fun fact um so she always calls herself aunt diane <laughs> which is fun uh, but she grew up training with leon collins and still like predominantly teaches his repertoire in her classes today um so there's a dance called 53 that i know i think they're all kind of numbers like number three number four things like that um, but it's like his repertoire that she's just been carrying on and she's just the most wonderful beautiful woman i've ever met so phenomenal um and then lynn dally i have that oops, i'm not taken from her but um she also started the jazz tap ensemble which is very popular in new york um kind of during the 90s so yeah it's cool to see these women sort of take in and just be able to share with the next generation and still do it today um another big um influential moment in the eight, 1989, the movie Tap came out. And this is kind of the first time that Tap had really been in like a movie setting since the 50s. Um, it featured Gregory Hines, who is a phenomenal dancer, phenomenal actor. You might've seen him um, 
I think he did some the was it the Jerry Lewis telethon and things like that. Jerry Lewis was a thing. Sorry, I don't know. Anyways, <laughs> but he was just kind of on a lot of shows like that in the '90s, and unfortunately passed away quite young. But um, this is also the first time that some of these old hoofers were able to like dance together again. And there's an iconic scene. It's like ten minutes long, so I didn't throw it in the show. But um, there's this young guy who comes in and he's like, "Oh, I want to challenge you guys," and all these old guys are like, "Challenge, challenge." challenge and they all kind of come out of the woodwork and then have this little jam and it's like one of my favorite scenes of any tap film and it's worth watching because yeah there's just all these guys from like age 60 to like 70 to 80 just like throwing it down again and Sammy Davis Jr. is in it uh Buddy Briggs Arthur Duncan uh Steve Condos and people like that so you get a chance to watch tap it's a great movie all right so let's talk about tap today um Thank you to the social media and the internet. TAP is super accessible today. Um, you can learn from anywhere in the world. Um, I have friends who TAP in Brazil, who TAP in Japan, who TAP in Germany. Um, there's this awesome girl in Ukraine right now who's like kind of fighting while the war is happening around her, but she's like one of the better TAP dancers I've seen in a long time. Um, a lot of these young people too are like making them known on TikTok and on Instagram and things like that. So people are getting more access to tap dance whenever they want, um, which is awesome. Uh, there's also been like a lot more of it on TV lately, which is awesome. So I don't know if any of you saw it. Ooh, Spirited um, with Will Ferrell and Ryan Reynolds that came out this past um, December, but uh, Chloe Arnold, who's down here, choreographed the whole thing and got to spend like 10 months teaching the two of them how to tap dance, which is pretty cool. <laughs> uh, Spirited. Yep, I think it's on Apple TV. Um, I have not seen the full thing yet, but I've seen the tap scenes, which is what I care about. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there's also um, dozens of tap festivals that still happen today, which is where I got most of my training. Um, so, for example, there's one in Chicago called the Chicago Human Rhythm Project. It happens for a week to three weeks every summer. You have about like 10 artists fly in who are some of the top in the world, and all you do is take classes with them for like eight hours a day every day for a week exhausting but it's wonderful because you just get so much knowledge all at once and it makes it kind of more accessible to access these legends and other um like up and coming dancers and stuff like that um so that's where I got like a lot of my training growing up and it was also a way for you to like meet other tap dancers like in your community so like I met friends from New York and LA and like who've gone on to do amazing and great things so um and then yeah it's just like I said in more movies and tv so Chloe Arnold again down here She's been choreographing for the James Corden show and has done like over a hundred episodes and included tap dancers on that and whatnot. She has this dance company called here called the Syncopated Ladies who've had their own videos been shared out by Beyonce and others. <laughs> um, so they're definitely worth checking out. Um, they're more kind of like a LA commercial type scene. And then you have the other side, which is traditional concert dance. Like if you went to see a ballet or like a modern dance company do like a full length performance. Um, that would be this company right here, which is uh, Dorrance Dance. I've trained with a lot of their dancers. They're all in like some of the best in the world. <laughs> and, like just create really cool, um, I, I would say music because they'll take like, for example, they did a show where they mic'd up all the taps to like a drum kit. So if they tap their toe, it sounded more like a drum or like a, like a weird synth sound or things like that. So they kind of just are more experimental and trying new things and um, I'll talk about more about Michelle Dorrance in a second. She's just had a big influence on um, um, American tap dance today. So uh, Michelle, kind of similar to me, grew up dancing in what we call youth tap ensemble. So there's a handful of these in the country. It's just youth who just want to tap dance like 20 hours a week and you get to perform with a company that's like you kind of learn how to be a professional essentially. So she was with the North Carolina Youth Tap Ensemble. Mine was the Keen Sense of Rhythm Youth Tap Ensemble. Um, but yeah, she moved to New York, started this company called Dorrance Dance. Um, she's won a MacArthur Genius Grant, um, then a bunch of other awards, or sorry, MacArthur Fellow. Um, and yeah, a bunch of other awards and has just, I don't know, she has like a very unique way of adding movement to her dancing, like adding more of the physical, because I think in this elder generation, a lot of people focus more on the music and don't perform. So you'll see a bunch of professionals who are just looking down, arms are kind of just dangling, but their feet are going a million miles a minute. Um, but she kind of brought a lot more um, interesting nuance uh, to perform. Yeah, and she was also in stock for a long time, so.
Um, another familiar face that you may have heard of, Savion Glover. Um, he started out really young being on Broadway. He was in a show called The Tap Dance Kid. Um, he's dubbed his own style is called Freestyle Hardcore, which I would agree with because he's insane. He can just 45 minutes with him and a drummer on stage, just go nonstop, no drink of water, anything, just be totally in the zone. Him and the drummer, you can hear them like, He'll be like, da, 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 da. the drummer will be like, da, 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 da. like to, you can just hear them communicating. And it's really like <laughs> nuanced and like you might not notice it right away, but the intelligence that's happening in a room with him and a drummer is phenomenal. Um, but anyways, uh, he was in Bring It Up Noise, Bring It Fun. Um, he got a Tony for Best Choreographer. Um, he did a bunch of stuff on Sesame Street. He was Mumble, The Penguin, and Happy Feet. Um, he's kind of like, our most famous in the community if you will, to this day, um, just because he's phenomenal and he's just got the recognition. So, and then I'll just touch on, yeah, Chloe Arnold again. Um, she's doing a lot to bring tap dance into a more of a commercial setting, um, getting people on TV. She's been included on So You Think You Can Dance, Good Morning America, The Ellen Show, um, John Legend and Chrissy Teigen's Christmas special, over 50 episodes of The Late Late Show. And like I said, Beyonce shared her videos, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> and oh, I should mention, she has worked with Beyonce as a choreographer too. Like she's been the like behind the scenes person. So she also has a phenomenal record. And then I just want to touch on one last thing. Um, so in 1928, Leonard Reed and Willie Bryant wanted to create a dance that everybody knew, um, which is called the Shim Sham. Uh, and it was attended to be the finale of a piece. Um, so Michelle Dorrance here, taught it to Stephen Colbert on The Late Show, and he did it on live television and learned it on the spot. Um, so that's my way of saying, if you can learn it, you can learn it too. <laughs> so if you ever want to learn the Shim Sham, let me know. Um, I'm going to do a little example of it um, and show you what it's all about and just show you that there's a variety of ways of doing it as well. Um, and then we'll kind of end it there, take questions. We have two clips at the end if you want to stay around and watch. Um, one of them is the Nicholas Brothers kind of doing that jump split kind of craziness. And then the other one is from a tap festival that used to happen in Minneapolis um, that uh, three of some of the dancers on the world were like, why don't we just get on stage and dance together? So they do a little improvisation. Um, Diane Walker, who I was talking about, is included in it. Uh, Jason Samuel Smith, who's also crazy phenomenal. And then Dormisha Subri Edwards, who's just a force of nature. And just watching them get to interact is kind of a joy on stage. So I'll do the shim sham. We'll take questions and then I'll show you the clips. Okay, um, one thing about the shim channel, I'll say while I'm on the mic. Um, so I'm going to show you the simple way first, the way that everybody can learn how to do, and then I'll show you the faster, more advanced way. You want to see a bunch of local tap dancers doing it at the show, um, the reflection show on May 17th. For a Zoom crowd, the reflection show on May 17th, they will be doing the shim channel. So you'll get to see it live there. <laughs> All right, so we have simple. You just have this is a shuffle. Step, shuffle, step, shuffle, ball change, shuffle, step, and then you repeat it. Um, and then there's a break, so you could do step, go, step, hop, step, hop, step, hop, chin. Simple way. And then now here's the more fast upgraded way, which is. Anybody have a question? Yeah. Oh, you have, sorry, you have a mic. Well, I was just, sorry, this is for the Zoom crowd. I was just wondering, will you tell us a little bit about your dance history? Oh, I meant to do that at the beginning. Um, so I started dancing in the womb, literally. My mom was a dance teacher, um, owned a dance studio for about 10 years of my life, but probably 20 years of her life. Um, literally pirouetted till I was in the womb. She could feel me bouncing along with her. <laughs> so literally came out dancing. Um, and then I was part of the youth tap ensemble for about 15-ish years, um, which included 
performing in Chicago. We went to Lombard, Detroit, Poland multiple times. Um, performed in New York a few times. Um, I studied dance in college for a few semesters and then decided to do communications and be a part of a professional dance company instead. Um, so I danced with Kalina Miller Dance for about, I want to say, five years, and we got to do a lot of performances in the Twin Cities. And being part of a professional company is just really cool because, like, being a part of the creative process is, I think, one of my favorite parts of dancing. Um, and then I also danced with the professional company for Keen Sense of Rhythm, which kind of ebbs and flows and is different choreographers at different times, but super fun. And yeah, I took a break for a while. Now we're back in it. <laughs> so thank you to NLAA for that. <laughs> Um, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> I will not be opening up a studio here, but I will be teaching for reflections coming in the fall. Details still be worked out, but me and Molly had our first meeting about two weeks ago, and I'm very excited. Yeah, yeah. yes. How about the classes at the boat school? We kind of have joked about it. I don't know if we ever put anything in motion, but we could do a folk school class. Um, yeah, why not? We make some. Yeah. You teach this year, too. Right. It's going to be a long class. Very long class. Um, I know what choreography is, what is the outcome, but I know nothing about the process. Like when you choreograph a show, are you charting out the moves for the dancers is there something written that the dancers work from how, how does that work how does that process work that's a great question um so yeah so the question was um what is the process for choreography like how does one put choreography together and how do you end up producing a show um and there's a lot of different ways you could do it um the company that i was in we would kind of start with a big idea or a big theme um like one of the themes for the shows that we did was the dancing was the same every night, but the music changed every night. So it'd be an absolutely different score from like we would give the band the, like the different bands the dancing and they would just come up with their own music. So it was like a wild experience because my brain was just like, okay, different music, different vibe. You just kind of have to like shift the way you think about it, but you've done the move so much that it just it happens. But it's also like, I don't know, we had people come multiple to multiple nights and just be like, that was just wild experience. So that's one way you could like do it is pick a theme. Um, you could also just be inspired by a piece of music. Um, so I'm trying to think of who the artist is. Um, but the, anyway, so there's a company in Chicago who like they'll just take like a like a Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington and do like a whole suite of just their music in a night. So that would be like oh being like, oh, I really like this Duke Ellington song. Okay, so here's where the music sits. So like if I was thinking of like a single piece, for example, I'd be like, okay. Here's what the music's doing. Um, we have like an AABA -A -A form. So when the bridge hits, we're gonna do this type of movement instead. And so you kind of chart out the themes, but I've also been, <laughs> been in uh, like a class where the teacher's like, just does a step and they're like, yeah, that, okay, we're just gonna keep, and then they just keep adding on it until they find something that they like. And they're like, okay, now let's find music for it. So it really changes kind of on the choreographer, um, the show, the, the time and the space. Like Michelle Dorrance, for example, um, did a show called, I think it was Sound Space or something like that. And it was like all done in socks, but it was still tap dance moves. So that was kind of like the theme of the show. And so they had to figure out how to still make that interesting without actually making any sound. Um, so yeah, there's just- so is, is, there, is there any kind of written record? Is it, do you, you know, professional football teams have fancy plays? You know, Jason. Yeah, yeah. Notation. Notation. oh Good. yeah so they're asked if there's any kind of notation i think some people have tried to chart it musically um but because like you could have two different steps make the same sound it's kind of hard to do but um someone has figured it out it's just not widely used or recognized because it's difficult so i think the way that we just record and document is through video because you get the sound you get the movement um you get the like placement on stage but um, written wise, I think a few people have figured it out, but it's it's like learning a second language for the rest of us. <laughs> there is there is um, for ballet there is a written form, but it's so complicated. Yeah, yeah, like learning another language, like learning Russian. Well, it's it's sure. really learning by doing, learning by watching, learning by doing. Yeah, learning. Mm -hmm. I mean, learning by watching, also learning by listening. Like I've had teachers who are like, okay, turn around, close your eyes, and they'll do a step, and they'll be like do it <laughs> and like you just kind of end up doing 
the same sounds, but everyone does the movement a different way. So there's a lot of different elements involved. Like in, for example, in a ballet class, as Johnny was saying, like everything's pretty structured and it's had the same technique for like hundreds of years. So very much like this is first position, this is second position. Um, and then like tap dance, like because it is always evolving and it's always kind of been like the scrappy cousin of other dance forms. Like it's just kind of been, yeah, it's just kind of more improvisational in the process and in just the way that it's done. So yeah, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. First one, the dance are general, whether it's tap or classical ballet or whatever. Do they carry an equity card? Um and if not, do you have a union one? Yeah, I think you you carry a union. I didn't, um, but I have friends in New York who are part of like a union um, or are represented by an agency that has them as part of a union. So I don't think it's as popular, but I also, <laughs> in the defense of dancers, I don't know if dancers are as good at communicating what they need to do this professionally and get paid enough. And I think dancers have always kind of been underpaid and underrepresented and things like that. So I think there's room for it to grow and I think more people should consider it. So The other question is, you have a whole lot of money. Like anybody else, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it seems to me that might be part of balance. It might be an aesthetic that's intended. You know, like hmm. yeah, like a lot of our motion is in all kinds of dance. It's not there to keep them from falling down, but it's mm -hmm. you want to do it, or it's a some blending of that. I think there's some blending. Like there's definitely some like like this kind of arm movement. Um, is something that I do naturally, but I don't think about it, but it also is kind of balanced. Like if I'm doing something on this leg, this arm or this arm could keep me in touch. Did you but... learn that in Egypt? In Egypt? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's just, uh, you kind of just adopt what's happening around you. But there are um, like more Broadway forms have more of like a specific dance style and things are very um, precise. And the style that I grew up doing, or arms were rarely choreographed unless it was before a specific moment or a specific thing. Um, so it is kind of improvised as well, if you will. Yeah. Where did this excellent PowerPoint come from? How did you get it? Um, brain at six in the morning the today. <laughs> my, my own brain at 6 a.m. Yeah, Lacey's like, oh, we can do this. And I was like, yep. And then I woke up and I was like, oh my, we okay, we're going to put this together right now. So um, yeah, excuse my foggy brain. If it... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, you did have been in North Carolina some years ago in that uh, evening kind of concert. Mm. You did flat foot dancing. I didn't hear you mention that. Oh, it's flat foot. It's more like digging in the arms. Yeah. Right? But they carry these little boards around to tap. Yeah. And... I'm not as familiar with like clogging or flat foot similar dancing. Um, Because I, yeah, mostly grew up kind of like in a competition dance studio. Like did a lot of the Broadway style growing up, did a lot of the rhythmic. And clogging, I feel like, and tap dance have grown up side by side. Over, but kind of from the same spot. Um, I think tap dance is more like of a black art form, but clogging is kind of more steeped in Euro European roots and things like that. Um, so like I said, I think they're just cousins that kind of grew up next to each other, but had some influence, but not like a ton. Um, but yeah. Wind. Seems so perfect. Is it a stage name? <laughs> so my last name is Wind, um, was what Elton was asking. And no, it actually is kind of like whatever. So my parents who came over, grand, great grandparents who came over from kind of like Germany, Bohemia era, like got their na last name butchered in the immigration process. So we ended up as Wind, which is still a cool last name. I, I complain about that, but <laughs> yeah, I think it was Bond or Wind or something like that. I don't know. But yeah. You've traveled to Ireland multiple times. Do you, is that partly because of dance? Do you, are you interested in Irish dance as part of your interest in tap dance? Or is that mostly just historical content that you were sharing? Um, so uh, the question was, so I, my uh, grandparents are from Ireland. So a lot of my travels to Ireland have been to see family, but um, a lot of my family did either grow up doing Irish dancing originally or chose Irish dancing over tap dancing, but my mom's side is very much split in half. I'm like, you're an Irish dancer, you're a tap dancer, and that's kind of a running joke in our family. Um, but I have taken a few Irish dance classes just kind of for like cross training, 
And Irish dance is different enough where it's really hard for me to pick up because because you're so constricted to the movement and the steps are very particular. There's less, not less room for creativity, but like the steps are very much like what they are. Like you learn, a, I can't remember the name of them, but um, yeah, it is a little bit more difficult and I should take more classes to be honest. So, soon. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do you know anything about, I heard, I have heard that the reason that Irish dancing is so stiff on top is because it was also suppressed. They were not allowed to dance. And so that way, people looking in the windows couldn't tell they were dancing. Did yeah, I have heard that. I tried to, because I was going to add that into the presentation, but now it's apparently up to interpretation by a lot of people, but just for the Zoom crowd. Um, so Irish dancing, the arms are very uh, restricted. The rumor has it is because like when um, England was occupying Ireland, they weren't allowed to dance or like celebrate or like enjoy themselves at the bar, I guess. Um, so a lot of their dancing, they to kind of like stay level-headed and do all their dancing here so if a British officer walked by they couldn't tell that they were dancing or they were moving or walked by a hedge or whatever. I like that rumor so I'm going to stick with it in my own brain. <laughs> it's one of those things you're told as a kid and you're like yeah okay and it stays in there forever so yeah I think yeah yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. What brought you to Ely? Oh um my partner Jay oh the question was what brought me to Ely um Actually, no, forget Jay. Um, <laughs> I, Jay's great, but um, no, I have just always loved this landscape. I came up growing up going to the Boundary Waters and other parts of the North Shore. I've always wanted to move north. I never felt like Minneapolis or Salt Lake or wherever else I've lived has felt like home, I guess, but I've always just been drawn up here. So it's always been on the table. Me and Jay talked about it for a long time, and then he got the job at Paragus, and we're like, see you, we're going. <laughs> so it's, yeah, it's beautiful to be up here, and I I, I love the community. So thank you all for being so welcoming as well. Oh, closing tap dance. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll close, and then later we can just run these. We can keep the volume down, and if you want to watch them, great, and if not, great too. But um, I'm going to do a piece called Laura that I learned and it's by Buster Brown and the music was specifically written for the dance. Um, I'm not going to play the music so I'm just going to do it. I probably won't do all of it because I don't know how much I remember off the top of my head right now. Or we'll just do the beginning. So um, yeah, this is Laura by Buster Brown. This floor is a lot scarier. Well, thank you all for listening to me ramble today and learning a little bit more about tap dance. I hope you're able to go see some dancing at some point. Um, if you want, I'll play the Nicholas Brothers clip and then also the clip from that tap festival that happened in the Twin Cities a few years ago. So, thank you. Thank you.